Hey, The Way family and friends. While we always regret not being able to gather together for worship, we thought it was best as we anticipate four to eight inches of snow in our area to move worship to online only this weekend. There will be no in-person worship so that you can stay safe off the roads and stay warm at home. Today in our worship, we're going to continue our worship series called Beloved, where we're journeying through John's entire gospel. Our online worship video will feature two songs by the Way Worship Band and a sermon message on one of the most famous Bible passages, John chapter 3, verse 16. If you're watching this and worshiping online with us, please drop a comment in the video or click on the link below to head over to thewaychurchva.com and fill out our digital connect card. You taking just a few seconds to comment or click helps us to be able to best serve you and reach others. So may God bless your worship so that you know whether you're gathering together or not, whether your life is going great or you wish things were going different, whether you're healthy or sick, whether you're with loved ones or feeling alone, whether you're free in Christ or feel stuck in guilt, may God bless your worship so that you know Jesus calls you his beloved and this is a place for you. I had never heard him speak, but I had to ask him anyway. In fact, I didn't even know if he could talk, but I thought it was worth a shot. His wife, his three daughters, his oldest granddaughter, and I, well, we all stood around Samuel's bed, and within a week, it would be his deathbed. Samuel was old, and his health had been rapidly declining in recent months. When I met him, he could no longer talk or could barely speak. I was just a pastoral intern, and Samuel's funeral would be the first funeral I got the privilege of preaching the gospel at. But on that day, after I shared a passage, a devotion of comfort with Samuel and his family, Samuel's wife said, Pastor, that passage you just read, that's my favorite Bible verse. And then... Everyone in the room went around and shared their favorite Bible verse. Samuel just smiled, but it looked like he was trying to speak. So I asked him, Samuel, what's your favorite Bible verse? I'd never heard him speak before. I didn't even know if he could, but I thought I'd ask. And Samuel spoke. John 3.16. That's all he said. But I heard Samuel speak, and it would be the only and last thing I would ever hear him say. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's easy to see why it was Samuel's favorite verse. It's easy to see why that verse is many Christians' favorite verse. It's so simple and down to earth. God loved you. He sent his son for you, therefore eternal life is for you. It's so simple, and yet it soars in terms of elegance and significance. I mean, come on, that God would condescend to send his son to die, and that through believing in him as our Savior, we get eternal life? Everyone loves John 3.16. Why not? What's not to like? But do you know that John chapter 3 keeps going after verse 16? Keep reading John chapter 3 to verse 18, 19, 20, or 36. Who do you know that has those verses memorized as their favorites? Those verses are just as much of part of God's word as verse 16, and yet right after that most amazing Bible verse, we read verses of scripture that are some of the most perplexing to Christians and to non-Christians alike. Verses that raise some of the most serious and heart-wrenching questions about our faith and our God. Here are those verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Heavy words to hear, hard words to hear, perhaps even hurtful words to some, I mean, how can this be? How can this be that God, who so loved everyone, can in the same breath clearly communicate the bad that will happen to those who do not believe in him? Wrath, condemnation. How can this be that a loving God could send people to hell? It's fascinating that the most famous passage follows up with verses that might be the most frustrating. So it's time we talk about it. The big question that I want to answer and talk about in this sermon video is this. How can this be? How can this be that a loving God would send people to hell? And also, I want to answer this. For those of you watching who may have been asked that question by thoughtful friends, how can this be? How can this be that we can answer that question? Those two questions we'll look at and answer in this sermon, but I need to say this to start. I don't know, maybe it's not needed to be said, but maybe it's worth it. I don't know. But here we go. Personally, I don't like the idea of hell. I don't like to think about it, and I don't like to talk about it. I don't want there to be a hell, and most of all, I don't want anyone to go there. If I can dispel just one stereotype for you today, it's this. Preachers, at least I can speak for myself, preachers take no pleasure in hell. I can't stand the movie caricaturizing the pastor banging on the pulpit shouting, you're going to hell, as if he seemingly enjoys himself as he shouts this message. I don't know any pastor who takes pleasure in talking about the biblical teaching of hell. But we have to. I have to talk about it. Well, so many people pretend that hell just doesn't exist, and as much as we'd all like to act as though it didn't exist, well, Jesus didn't have that luxury. He knew hell did exist. Therefore, I can't apologize for talking about something that Jesus talks about. But for a moment, can you and I just consider the idea and the argument that hell does not exist. If you argue that there is no hell, you're arguing that there is no justice from the one who created all things, including people. And if there is no justice for the things that people do in this life, then you're arguing for the meaninglessness of all things. Nothing we do matters. Finally, nothing that you or I or anyone or Jesus did or does it matters at all. None of it. It doesn't matter. And furthermore, all those pangs of conscience, those ideas which people have that this or that is inherently either right or wrong, it doesn't mean anything because there is ultimately eternally nothing really at stake if there's no hell. But take the idea to its logical end that nothing we do matters. Do that and we're faced with another major question. What about the Osama bin Ladens, the Adolf Hitlers, the people who do unspeakable harm to children and women? What about them? Look, I don't know about you, but I want a God who cares. I want a God who is outraged at evil. I want a God who remembers. If you ask, how can a loving God send people to hell? You also have to ask, how can a fair, a just God tolerate the evil that we see in the world. And there it is, the concept of justice, what's fair. You know, I get it. I, I shudder at the thought of any sinner who does not repent going to hell. Say it ain't ho, say it's, it's just simply not fair. But my ideas of what's fair and not fair, my ideas as a sinner are not the standard that determines 
what's fair for other sinners. Think about that. We all have our ideas of what's right and wrong, and increasingly we are being led to believe that right and wrong and matters of truth are personal. But I ask, is my brain and yours that which sets the standard of what's good and evil and that which is just? Our human sense of justice is an echo of something larger than us. For in all the judgments we make, even our judgments about judging itself, and in all the stamping of our feet that we do about what is fair and not fair, all the times we speak about truth, a truth, the truth, or our truth, we're acknowledging that there is truth. There is a standard that some things are wrong, some things are dreadfully, unspeakably wrong, that there is such a thing as divine judgment of what's evil, and it directly relates to divine love of what's good. There is a God whose very nature is, as the Holy One, to oppose evil with all that he is and to respond with justice. And that should give us a moment of pause, whether we're convinced there's hell or not. At the minimum, that should make you and I think again about any distinction we make between ourselves and those really bad people. We need to take a look at the badness within us. Deep down, we want to think of ourselves as strugglers, the heroes of our story who rail against adversary. That way, when we make a mistake, a sin, we can say, if anyone knew the struggle that I go through, they couldn't possibly blame me for the things that I do or the things that happened. The reason we say this is that no one ever wants to think anything's their fault. It's human. I mean, think about it. You've, you've been there before. All it takes is a small wound from someone else, even just a loved one, and we justify the most appalling thoughts and actions in retaliation. Yet in our own private shames, in our own personal vices, and in our particular dislikes of this person or that people group, what we see is the same quality as is found in the worst things done by any human. We discover we too have done the opposite thing of good, the opposite thing of what God says is good and right and true and lovely and pure. Don't you see it? Whether you are comparing the wrongs of those you term the worst of the worst or your wrongs, which you might label as not that bad, our wrongs reject what's right. Our wrongs reject God. And when people reject God, that is more serious than words can say. One author put it this way, all sin is an act of insane defiance and a basic denial of God's goodness. I see in my own unlovely life something in me that is always saying to God, leave me alone. I don't need you. I don't want you. Don't tell me how I should be. I don't belong to you. Because of that, if God decided that if humans sin once, they're condemned, they're damned, well, if God decided that, I wouldn't like it, but I couldn't hold it against him because that would be fair. It would be just because God is the standard, the judge of what is fair and what justice is. So if God said, you sin once, you're done, you're gone forever, he'd be right. But he didn't say that. God has never and will never say that. And let me explain that. Better let Jesus explain that. He did almost 1,500 years before he ever walked the earth. The Israelites, God's people, were in the wilderness and there's poisonous snakes tearing through the camp, killing people left and right. God could have provided healing however he wanted. He could have taken the snakes away, just snapped his finger. He could have healed the people right there on the spot but he had Moses put a bronze snake up on the pole and said that if anyone looks at that, they'll live. And now in John 3, we find out from Jesus the reason God did that. Listen to the two verses Jesus speaks prior to the most famous one in John 3. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't back humans into a corner. He didn't catch us in the act of wrong and sin and say, aha, I gotcha. Now repent or die. God is not today saying, follow me so that I can save you from what I'm going to do to you if you don't follow me. God never said that. He could have. He could have just been the prosecutor and judge, but God has never said that and he will never say that. What he says is this, I love you. You're my beloved. God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him won't die, but they'll have eternal life. Whoever looks up to Jesus hanging up in the air and believes that there, there is my God and there is the one who loves me more than life itself. There is something that doesn't make sense that a good man would die for the sins of the world, that there, In a spirit birth confession, what you have is faith and what you have is eternal life for you. Look, hell is not a teaching gleefully spoken about on other people over whom I feel morally superior or better than in any way. It can't be because I deserve to go to hell because I sinned. I deserve exactly the same as a murderer, a child molester, an Adolf Hitler or an Osama bin Laden or whoever it is you think is the worst sinner. I deserve hell in the same way you deserve it because we're all at fault for our sin. I don't want that to be true, but Christian beliefs aren't based on what I would prefer to be true. They're based on what the Bible says is true. And even though you want to look away and ignore this whole pesky hell thing, well, don't. Let the sorrow in. Sorrow over your own life, sorrow over what you and I deserve, sorrow over every time we sin, because we're saying to God, I don't need you. And when you let that in and you see that in yourself, well, you see Jesus saying, over my dead body, over my dead body, I won't let you go. Look, I can't say it any better than one of my favorite college professors who said this. Deny hell and you can never see very far into the heart of Christ who walked up a hill under a threatening sky and called your disaster on himself. Deny hell and nothing Jesus did will make any sense. Especially, you will miss how intense, how passionate, how personal everything is that we read in his deeds and in his face those final hours. The message of his anguish is meant for you. I don't want you to go to hell. I won't let you go to hell. Look, I can't say it any better than that, nor can I say it any better than how John says it in one of his letters. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You ask, how could a loving God send people to hell? Well, you also have to ask how a fair and just God could tolerate the evil that we see in this world. And the answer is, he can't, he couldn't. And because God couldn't tolerate evil, he gave his son Jesus that whoever believes in him, whoever looks to Jesus as their savior, as the one who suffered for evil in hell in their place, Whoever looks to him as the one completely separated from God while dying on the cross, because that's what Jesus' crucifixion was, him going to hell and back so you wouldn't have to. Whoever believes in Jesus won't go to hell. They will have eternal life in heaven. So if you struggle with the doctrine of hell, join the club. If it fills you with sorrow, join the club and see this. Jesus' sorrow moved him to be crucified and separated from his Father's love so you would never have to be. Let your sorrow move you too so that you don't have to go to hell. It's already been done for you. If you wonder, how could it be that God would send people to hell? Well, no, you're not alone in that question. 
But for now, let me ask you to think of that question in this way. How could it be that a loving God would send people to hell? Well, in a very real sense, he can't and he doesn't. Rather, people send themselves to hell when they reject the love that Christ has given them. To not look to Jesus, to not trust in Jesus as your Savior, it is to reject him. It, it's like sitting on a tree branch and to your right is the trunk and to the left is the limb and you take a saw in your right hand and you cut off the branch that you're sitting on and you fall. It's your fault and not believing in Jesus. It, it'd be like taking the $980 million winning Powerball ticket in your hand and saying, you know what? Nah. And just ripping it up and throwing it away. C.S. Lewis said a person can't be taken to hell or sent to hell. You can only get there on your own steam. I don't say this to make you afraid or keep you afraid. I say that instead to point you to the man up on the cross, Jesus Christ, so that you might be inseparably with him forever in heaven. Look, go deeper than your sentimental thought of Jesus as your best friend or even some inspiring teacher or kindly helper who encourages you during the tough times in life. Jesus is all of those things, but see him first as your rescuer, your deliverer. See him as that and experience that walk toward heaven that just begins outside of the gates of hell. And see Jesus walk through the fire for you, walk with you through it all today, for he is the way to a place he's prepared for you in heaven. Now, if you're still listening to this, perhaps a more relevant question to you is how can it be that I answer this question, the question of someone asking, how can a loving God send people to hell? Look, I, I don't have any clever arguments. In this sermon, I tried and Many, many of the thoughts in this sermon I borrowed from people who I do think give clever responses to this. So maybe you point someone to this sermon by sharing it. You know, maybe you check out some books I could recommend, or maybe you go sit down with someone and, and show them what God says in John chapter 3. But what if you don't have the opportunity for any of that? Then perhaps the best thing to do is simply say to your friend who's asking, look, I know where I'm going. I know the way. Let me show you. Samuel, the man who wanted John 3.16 to be preached on at his funeral, was a career bus driver. For 30 years, Samuel was a bus driver and a good one at that, so I'm told. And you think about that. If someone were to be classified as a good city bus driver for over three decades, I would suspect that he had to have one important factor consistently right. In his profession as a bus driver, Samuel had to know where he was going. And he did. Samuel had it right. He knew his where, but not only for life. More importantly, Samuel knew his where in death. You want to know what Samuel spent his weekends doing up until the day he couldn't drive? He spent his weekends giving free rides. He gave rides to his family and his friends and anyone who would get in his car and come with him to church where they would hear words, not words of hellfire and brimstone or condemnation or wrath, but words of love and words of life. Words that told Samuel where he would be, words that took Samuel to where he is right now. I would suggest that there is one thing important in death and in life. It's where. Where are you going? Well, that's not a question that you have to wonder about. Not today, not anymore. You're going to heaven, to a place prepared for you, where you have eternal life with Christ. Look, how else can I say this? How can this be? How about this? For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that you who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And why? It's because you are Jesus's beloved. Amen.